Egypt's credit rating has been downgraded by Fitch Ratings to B, with a negative outlook, highlighting concerns about the country's economic situation. According to the report, Egypt's external liquidity buffers remain weak after a marked deterioration in 2022. Gross official reserves fell to $23.1 billion by year-end from $40.1 billion a year earlier. And this is mainly due to persistent current account deficits, high levels of external debt, and the pandemic's effects. The negative outlook suggests that there could be further downgrades in the near future if Egypt's economic situation does not improve. Fitch's downgrade may impact the country's ability to borrow money from international financial institutions, and it could have implications for the country's foreign investment climate. The Fitch downgrade is part of a wider trend of rating agency concerns about emerging markets, which have been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Moody's has also lowered its outlook on Egypt's credit rating in the past year, and other countries in the region have experienced similar downgrades. Professor Ayaz Ahmed Shafi, Principal, Percept Human Capital, joins me now on Business Edge to take a look at this. Professor Shafi, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So in their report, Fitch highlighted external financing risk, plan investor settlements, exchange rates uncertainty, and even reduced external liquidity uh, buffers, particularly as part of the reason for Egypt's credit downgrading. So to what extent do you think that these factors have really influenced the negative outlook for Egypt? These obviously have been important and crucial uh, factors that have been taken into account. But uh, what is of great importance, and in my mind that, that's how I see this, is the overall approach that uh, uh, the government has had towards Egypt's economy. I mean, some reforms were promised, uh, certain things were to be acted upon, None of that has actually happened. Most of it actually at least hasn't happened. Now, what that means is that the impact overall is translating into these kind of data that is emerging. So while these factors do remain, remain important, the underlying theme is what one would want to look at. Uh, how is the government approaching the whole story of its economic collapse, actually? Right? Uh, are, are, they, are they trying to find ways of attracting for investment? I think it's in the reverse direction. And that, that's where the problem lies, actually. So while these factors do remain important, they do impact in a very direct way the rating that Fitch or any other Moody's would be looking at. But having said that, I would still stick by the earlier point that uh, it's the underlying factors that, that's making all the difference. So you use the phrase right now, economic collapse. Do you think that is the situation that Egypt's economy finds itself? Debt distress at the edge of it, about to default, economic collapse. For you, what does it mean for Egypt's economy? I, I was being a little harsh. But the fact of the matter is we are heading in that direction. Because if you really look at it, at the ground level, there hasn't been any concrete action so far as the government is concerned. Uh, and if you're looking at the IMF bailout, three billion, it's actually very small compared to what Egypt actually needs. So even if the bailout were to happen, and if uh, Egypt were to convince IMF to give the money that it's looking for, that wouldn't be sufficient to help it uh, in much, uh, in any meaningful manner. Now, if you look at the way uh, uh, the country has been run, or the way the poly economic policies have been executed, subsidies are rampant, Government costs continue to escalate, and if, if that's how it's going to go, then I, I am not uh, uh, prophesizing doomsday, mm. but we aren't too far, going to be too far away from it. Mm. All right, so let's look at what else Fitch said. They downgraded Egypt's long-term foreign currency issuer uh, de default rating, I beg your pardon, uh, to B from B+, plus with a negative outlook. When we look at this in terms of the impact on Egypt's ability to borrow money from financial markets, what do you think the impact of this downgrade will be? Would it also possibly lead to a sell-off of Egyptian bonds by investors? So, so far the bonds are concerned, there have been, uh, that foreign investors have been selling off the bonds uh, lately. That has been happening at the ground anyway, right? Whether this rating will uh, lead to a surge in that selling, uh, I'm not too sure. It's possible. But I, on the other hand, I also gather that uh, Saudi and uh, UAE are, have uh, been signing deals with the Egyptian authorities to invest in that country, right? So there is, there is a parallel event that is happening. Uh, Egypt is also signing up to the new development bank with BRICS. 
uh, so that is dependence on US dollar is all that is happening parallelly. But the fact of the matter is that when you start looking at the Egypt economy holistically, uh, at the ground level, the events don't suggest uh, uh, much of a direction, much of a long term plan so far as the government is concerned. So while this, uh, if you look at this selling of bonds or uh, pulling back from investment uh, in that market, uh, thus, I, I don't think this will be a huge shift compared to what's been happening. Mm. Uh, kind of, you, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this will become a torrent from a trickle, no. But it will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's how I see this playing out, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the credit rating agencies now. They've received criticisms, uh, criticisms in the past year or so, particularly from African finance ministers. I know Ghana's finance minister, Ken Oforiata, has been very vocal about how he thinks the credit rating agencies are not helping African economies. This is a downgrade from Fitch. We've seen it from Moody's, also um, Standard & Poor's. Those are the big three credit rating agencies. They've downgraded a number of African sovereigns in the past 18 plus months because of situations. But that downgrade makes it that much more difficult for these same sovereigns to find access to markets and to borrow money. So it becomes somewhat of a vicious cycle. You downgrade me because I can't pay. I can't pay because I can't get loans because you've downgraded me. Do you think we need to relook sort of this, not a relationship, but the standard and the ratings that these big three particularly are giving African sovereigns and the impact, the indirect and even often very direct impact that these ratings have on our economies? Uh, if you ask me, I, I don't want to uh, question the integrity of these agencies. I have no intention of doing that. I'm sure they know the job, and I'm sure they do a thorough job. But the problem with any kind of data or data analysis is how you present them. Right? That's the first one. Uh, you could say that there is always a bit of arm twisting involved when a major uh, global monetary fund, IMF kind of organization, or World Bank, is putting its money wherever and put certain conditions in place, right? And uh, most of the time, most of the governments kind of are reluctant to accept all of it, uh, if not most of it. So there are areas where they question and they would want to have it reviewed. That that's always uh, been so in most uh, of the cases. Now Egypt pulled back uh, some time ago. So I, I believe that was sometime in uh, Feb March kind of time. When they said, no, no, we are not going with the whole story as I may point, right? All the uh, reforms that they're looking for. Now, that being so, I, I, I am tempted to believe that there's a bit of arm twisting involved here because if the credit rating goes down for the country, uh, you know, Egypt would be forced to accept some of the terms that it may not have agreed to otherwise. Mm. So that, there, there lies a bit of uh, uh, issue there. But again, the other aspect is to look at it very realistically and say what is what is happening at the ground level. Now, the fact of the matter is that some of the reforms that have been demanded by IMF, some of the actions that have been required for that loan to come out, the government has refused to do that. The subsidies continue. The cost on government exchequer in terms of salaries for its people continues. The influence of the army. Uh, although there was a promise to reduce that interest on uh, the economy, uh, that hasn't been much diluted. Mm. So all that being so, I mean, I would say there is merit in saying that maybe some of the data, the way it is presented, the way it is projected, can be represented differently. Mm. That's all I would want to say. That's why we'll take that. So let's talk about debt sustainability because... Uh, unfortunately, like many African economies now, there are issues with uh, Egypt's debt sustainability. So the downgrade said also it stemmed from an increased risk of policy slippage and delayed reforms. For instance, there's the deterioration of public debt me uh, metrics, renewed uh, deterioration in government's interest costs, revenue as well, things that the government has failed to address. So in terms of this failure, will it put medium-term debt sustainability at risk? And you've also talked about reforms and a lack of movement on those reforms. Why do we see Egypt seemingly stalling on these same reforms that could be the way to help it uh, free its economy just a bit? It, it, you look at it this way, that uh, this government is a populist government. Uh, and uh, it's trying to stick to that because 
the uh, president, the government, the ruling dispensation knows that uh, the actions that are required, generally required, is, uh, is going to impact the masses and uh, there could be another Arab Spring for all women. And that could lead to serious trouble. So holding on to power is big, important for all the uh, governments, actually. That, that remains crucial. And that's one of the reasons why they are so reluctant to execute uh, the reforms that are necessary, right? The ability to service debt uh, is limited. The uh, ratio is poor. Zero to 20 is what we look at uh, as a, that's where most of the country. Egypt is in the range of about 29 percent. That ratio is 29 percent. That, that's a huge, huge challenge. Now, if that is where Egypt stands, uh, firm funding would be difficult to find, actually. Unless at the ground uh, there is clear indication that there is concrete action being taken by the government. For example, the wage bill for the government has to go down. I mean, 3%, 3.5% of the GDP, uh, unbelievable. And that's where Egypt stands, mm. right? Uh, when you look at the subsidy, bread subsidy, whatever food, food bread subsidy, that's phenomenal in terms of cost to the exchequer. Now, when you, if you have to take care of all that, uh, it, it's going to impact the masses. Unless there is reassurance in concrete terms that some action will lead to uh, a softening of these blows, uh, the masses are going to react. And that's where the reluctance for the reform comes from. Mm. So th there are issues in both. And that's something we see replicated across the continent as well in terms of some of these subsidies uh, and how governments are reluctant because it could lead to some mass unrest situations. But let's talk about currency. We can't talk about Egypt's uh, financial and economic situation without talking about the Egyptian pound at this time. There have been devaluations in the past year or so. Depending on who you ask, there have been one or two official. Uh, and we've seen a run, a run away from investors when it comes to Egypt's bonds. But in terms of the Central Bank of Egypt, there also seems to be a lacked mark of confidence, market confidence in the CBE and the new exchange rate regime. What do you think the implications will be for foreign currency inflows and particularly investor sentiments? How do investors feel right now about the Egyptian economy? So, so when you look at the foreign uh, currency, the exchange regulation that they have, uh, uh, it's not fully flexible. And that's what the foreign investors would want it to be. That way, uh, while it is, it has been devalued often enough, uh, but it's kind of stagnant now at about 32 uh, Egyptian pound. I think that's where we stand right now, 30 and 32. Now, that being so, uh, the investors would want to see a far more flexible approach open to the market forces rather than uh, being regulated. Uh, and and that, that's kind of impacting uh, the investors. Uh, having said that, I also believe very strongly that at the policy level, there isn't much action to attract investment, except for some major deal that uh, UAE, Saudi kind of countries could be getting into with uh, Egypt. Uh, I don't see too much happening. For example, uh, there could be a major action with regard to China. And uh, I believe some time ago, there was a, quite a bit of talk about Belt and Road Initiative that China has, which would have attracted a lot of uh, investment, a lot of uh, monies into Egypt, which would have also uh, created a, a good infrastructure for investors to get attracted to Egypt. I don't know how far that has moved. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I think there could have been a lot more action in these areas uh, to kind of bolster the confidence of the investors. So somewhere, I think the coherence of uh, action the synchronized effort of different agencies, I think that's a that's serious trouble there. There is one step forward, two step back kind of situation is uh, what I see happening out there. Mm. All right, so uh, Professor, yeah, um, Professor, before I let you go, let's quickly look at the projection for uh, the economy. So Fitch is expecting that e the Egyptian economy is going to grow about 4% in fiscal year 2023, down from 6.6% the previous year. And then it will recover and grow by 4.5% in 2024. This 4% still seems to be better than many African economies are expected. We're seeing a number of 1.92%, 2.9% uh, growth rates for this year. But when we look at it in terms of Egypt, it seems more retrogressive than anything. 
But is it also feasible? And is it something that Egypt will just have to take for the time being, given the internal economic situations as well as the global economic situations we're all faced with? The, the, this is like a, you have no choice. And uh, you're still happy because you're doing a little better than most of the African economies. You're doing a little better than what was projected earlier. So for 4% to 4.5 next year. But look at the look at the sluggishness of the growth. 4 to 4.5, uh, 0.5% growth over previous year. Who wants it? I, I'm sure not the Egyptians. Mm. Uh, no other economy would want something like that. But what, what is of importance is, having got this data, this data is based on current scenario. Assumption being not too much is being done or will be done to change the dynamics of the market, mm. right? Uh, if that is what it is, then I think somebody needs to sit up and say, okay, let's do a few things which will change this score. Uh, we don't want to go in with 4.5% in 2024. We want a little more than that, maybe six, maybe seven, seven, maybe 6.5, maybe 7.5, I don't know. But set a target, a benchmark, and uh, all the activities, all the actions uh, need to be planned around that kind of a number. You can't go in and say, since this projection is 4.5, well, we are fine, because there's some growth happening, so we, mm. we are okay with that. You can't take it like that. All right, so we'll end the conversation here because of time, but we'll keep our eyes on Egypt, the IMF re reform programs, the potential or lack thereof of the reforms, and of course, what will happen in the coming months with many of the things that uh, the president and his economic advisors are putting forth. Professor Ayaz Ahmed uh, Shafi, Principal Precept Human Capital, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, President.